Good morning, everybody. Good morning, those that are on Facebook this morning. I'm coming this morning from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Perilous times shall come. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. We are truly living in those days. We're living in perilous times right now. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's nothing that we can do to stop it. It's in God's word. But, Father, I just ask this morning, Lord God, that you would just lift us up right now. I ask, God, that you would allow our young people to begin to be obedient once again to their parents. Lord, teach us, Father God, that you and you alone are the way, Lord God. Lord, we truly are living in perilous times. And so, Father, I'm asking that you would cover each and every one of us here, every one of Father God that is not here with the blood of Jesus Christ. Draw us back unto you, Father God. Bring the prodigals back home for Father God. Fill these seats up right now, Father God. Send a fresh anointing to us this morning, Lord God. Bless the word that is going to go forth this morning, Lord. And we thank you for all these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Ooh, glory. God is so good, isn't he? Man, oh man, oh man. You know, I always think I don't want to leave how I came in. Amen? Amen? Many of you feel that way? I mean, sometimes we drag ourselves in, you know, and uh, we don't want to leave the same way. <clears throat> I'm going to share just two passages today and uh, make one point. I'm going to be brief, though, so give Pastor lots of time. Uh, <clears throat> in Mark... Chapter 6, starting in verse 7. And he called the twelve to himself, and he began to send them out two by two. He gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey. That's the important point I want to make here. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper, in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And then he went on to share that, you know, wherever they go, as they're received, bless and leave a blessing. Those that don't receive, he says, kick off the dust and move on. <clears throat> the next passage is in John. And, you know, we see, <laughs> my point this morning is about provision, God's provision. Now, for the disciples, you know, they, they told them what had happened. They came back and just said, man, we did amazing things. Healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out demons. They left with nothing and were equipped with everything. Amen? Amen. So then we see the story of, and I'm not going to turn there, but when Jesus fed the pretty much 10,000, 5,000 men, but there were women and children, so he took a small provision and expanded it to account for everyone. Jesus always is enough isn't he? And that's my point this morning. 
and I'm going to read out of John, but before I do, just get the image of provision. Some of you need financial provision. Some of you, like Sister Joyce, she needs housing provision. Shariah, too. You know, we, we all need something, right? But he is enough for all of us. Amen? And he goes on to say, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. In verse 48 of the sixth chapter, he goes on to say, I am that bread of life. Again, the provision. And you know, we have to take every part of the Lord. Right? We can't be picker, pick, picky and choosing over just what we like. There's some parts that are difficult to bear. When he said, you must suffer. You have to pick up your cross and follow after me. We're all going through stuff. This church may have dwindled in numbers, but it's been magnified by suffering. <clears throat> I'm waiting to get to that other side, right? Dragging one foot behind me sometimes, but I'm going to get there. As I shared about my boss's mother, I mean, that's just incredible. I mean, she was dying. And the doctor couldn't shrink his, he, she goes, he couldn't go small enough. I, that's just incredible. And God's not done with us. But what we are enduring on behalf of others is producing fruit to everlasting life. So in verse 48, he says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they're dead. The world can't provide what only Jesus Christ can because he is the bread of life. This is the bread which comes down for he from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. You know, when he fed all those. The disciples still didn't know who he was, right? I mean, he even just said, your hearts are hardened, you know? You really don't get it. They did finally get it, didn't they? But as Pastor Bird pointed out, it took the Holy Spirit to be inside, to illuminate the reality that he is the bread of life. And then he went on to really creates some perplexing things by saying what he said. In verse 53, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's a radical saying, amen? And I've pointed it out before, but it's the Lord comes sometimes. He said, blessed are those who are not offended in me. We sometimes get kind of offended, you know, by the things that he puts in our standing. Speak to that, and it'll be moved. Right? Sometimes we stand there perplexed, like, okay, what am I supposed to do now? You know? And other times we pray, like we've been praying for my boss's mother. It's like, you know, I never met her. It's just like, Lord, just heal her or take her home. She wants to go home. She knows you. Nope. I told my boss yesterday, God's not done with her. And the, the bigger picture is my boss was an alcoholic for 26 years and was disbanded from her family. She didn't speak to her mother in 26 years until her mother got ill and they took her in and my boss is healed. The relationship is healed. And even unto death. And then the Lord says, nah, I'm not done yet. Not done yet. I'm not done with her, and I'm not done with her mother. But it gives me such faith. My faith is built 
when I see the look in her eyes when she's crying and she's like, I don't get it, but God is so good. And I go, yeah, he's so good. But we have to partake every part of him, even when it's difficult, amen? So let's just prepare to partake. Lord, we want to partake all of you good parts, the difficult parts, those parts that we say in a perplexing way, I don't know, Lord. I don't get it. Why? And we all have those moments. And as long as we move past those moments, when we stay there, that's sin. That's, you can't stay in that place. We have to move forward. And we declared it today. You said it, Lord. It is done. And as pastor's been teaching, let us walk as if it is done. We, we, need, we need to walk in that. Amen? Amen? So be encouraged this morning. As we partake, Lord, we want all of you. Withhold nothing, Lord, from us. We need all of you, Lord. We're empty and we need to be filled. So as we partake, Lord, cleanse us. Redeem us. Illuminate by your spirit those areas, Lord, that you want to touch this morning. I have areas that the Lord has to touch. And, Lord, I'm saying yes to you, Lord. Do it, Lord, your way. In and in our midst, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and partake bread and cup. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good morning. Father, we come before your throne in Jesus' name. Let the Spirit of God move mightily and powerfully in our midst this day. In Jesus' mighty and precious name, amen. This coming Thursday, June 29th, um, is the reason why we celebrate this particular event. It's one of the feasts that is celebrated all the way from the times of the early church. Uh, June 29th, and we celebrate that as we gather together the Sunday of that week, so Today is not technically the day of the Christian martyr. June 29th is the day of the Christian martyr. But we celebrate it on the Sunday in which that feast occurs. The ancient church called this the feast of the martyrdom of Saints Paul and Peter. And they celebrated the fact that the two key leaders two of the major leaders of the early church sometime in the mid-60s A.D. paid the ultimate price for their apostolic witness, and that is they gave their lives under the reign of the Roman Emperor Nero. It was a time when many believers in Jesus lost their lives. They began to be persecuted, and it's where the term martyr became a technical term. The term martyr in Scripture, in the Greek New Testament, there are actually four terms used. The term martyr or martus was simply an individual who bore witness. You had three other words. Martyreo was the verb form of bearing witness or testifying. Martyria was the word for testifying in court. It was, it was a witness or a testimony in court. And then the Greek word marturion was a, a, the actual witness itself but it was it was a term normally used 
it was used by Jesus to encourage his disciples that, that what they were going to do, what they were going to be called to do as his disciples was to bear witness. Now we have a, uh, you know, on Sundays after service we have a discipleship meeting for the young people and every so often we have a Sunday where we can't uh, hold that meeting because of other meetings that are taking place that day. Today is one of them. So we're going to say that the message is going to be your discipleship meeting today because this idea of bearing witness to Jesus, it epitomizes discipleship. It's the goal of discipleship. It's what discipleship is all about. And so Jesus encouraged his disciples. We know that we, we can look at the verse in uh, Acts chapter 1. We know that when the disciples were with Jesus in those 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, Acts chapter 1 describes what was going on, and Acts 1 1 says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Luke wrote Acts, the former treatise is at the Gospel of Luke, and, and it's a two book description of the work of God in Christ and the work that the church picked up to complete the mission that Jesus had begun. I emphasize this on our Wednesday nights. Why didn't history just end when Jesus was raised from the dead? Well, it didn't end because Jesus' being raised from the dead was only half of God's purpose being accomplished. The dominion mandate that God gave to the man and the woman, and hence to all of us, in Genesis, when he created the world, created the universe, created the man and the woman, was get dominion in the earth. Exercise my kingdom authority in the earth. You will be my image bearers. You will be my representatives to manifest my desire to bless all of creation. Well, the serpent had something to say about this. Of course, in the third chapter, and see, the serpent's job, he's the Satan, he's the prosecuting attorney. The devil's original purpose as the prosecuting attorney was not necessarily the way we think of the, the devil being so evil and so ungodly and intent to steal and to kill and destroy. Do you know when, when the evil aspect of Satan's ministry began? It was after Jesus had died and was raised from the dead. And you go to the book of Revelation. In Revelation 12, Jesus ascends to heaven. Satan's one of the sons of God. He walks back and forth before the throne of the Lord. And Jesus ascends to heaven and says, one of my first jobs is get out of here. And when he got cast down to earth, Revelation 12 says, he became angry. And he turned his anger against God's people. That's, that's when he starts to become the dragon, if you will. That's when he empowers the beast and the false prophet. And, and Babylon rides upon the beast. And, and this is when he begins his all-out assault against God, God's kingdom, and God's people. So what was he doing before that? He's the Satan, which is the prosecuting attorney. What does a prosecuting attorney do? He proves people are guilty. So the Lord tells the man and the woman, be my image bearers, be my representative. I've created this universe out of gracious giftedness of my heart. I want to release my grace and my gifts and my blessing to all the cosmos. And the serpent says, uh-uh. They're, they're not going to be able to do that. What, who, who, who do they think they are? God? Who do you think they are? God? Well, I'm, I'm just going to do my job. I'm going to prosecute them in your court, prove them guilty, 
and he does, and he's right, the man and the woman fail. They are guilty. They're guilty of when faced with ultimate allegiance to themselves or ultimate allegiance to the Lord. Unfortunately, they choose to be a, to, to represent their reality by showing allegiance to themselves and their own desires. So the devil, this, that's, that's, that's just his job. And see, when Jesus comes, this is why God became man. God the Father said, well, Satan, in essence, your, your premise is that human beings cannot fulfill my purpose. Well, here's my perspective on that. I say it, it's going to come to pass. So God sends his son, a human being, God and man, but he's a human being. And the purpose of the Gospels, the purpose of the Gospels is to show that he will fulfill the dominion mandate as a human being. That's why right at the start of his ministry, what, what, what takes place at the start of Jesus' ministry? He gets baptized, the Father speaks to him, the Holy Spirit descends upon him, and immediately he goes in the wilderness to face whom? The Satan. The Satan says, okay, here's another one who's going to fail. That's my job. It's my job. It's just he's doing his job. My wife and I always say, now my dog is, you know, he's a dachshund, so he's short to the ground. Another dog story. But anything that's within his frame of reference belongs to him. Now, he watches that front door meticulously, you know, just barking at everything in the neighborhood, protecting the house, guarding his territory. When my wife's home, he just follows her around the house, watching out for her, taking care of her. But one of his other jobs in his mind is to pull plugs out of the wall, to pull plugs out of electrical strips, and then to chew up the plugs. He loves, we, lights never go on in the house because, oh, he's doing his job. He's, he's pulling the plugs out. Like, and anything, my wife, he can be in the other room and drop paper to the floor. And before she can reach down to get it, like a lightning, he comes, he's got that paper, he runs off and chews it all up. And, of course, one of the difficulties of his job is he's always throwing up because of all the stuff that he, but it's, his, it's just his job. Not righteous, nor evil, not good or bad, just his job. That's the serpent. That's the Satan. He was just doing his job. And how good was he? Every human being up to Jesus, he prosecuted them successfully. They sinned. They turned away from God. They embraced their own purposes and desires. Okay? Sin is deeper than I don't smoke, I don't chew, and I don't go with the girls that do. All right? It's way deeper than that. Sin is about making my desires to be of greater importance than fulfilling the Father's will. So he confronts Jesus. Mark records it. Luke records it. Matthew records it. All at the start of Jesus' ministry. Three temptations. Jesus passes them all. And Jesus passes them by saying, you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And it says Satan left him for a while, and then if you go through the gospel records, he's every so often he pops up at a, at a key moment, and he's putting Jesus to the test right up to the end 
when Jesus sweats blood in the garden. Not my will, but yours be done. Essence of sin. Not my will, but yours be done. You can all pray for anything you want, but every prayer should end, not my will, but yours be done. We do not know. I know there's those brethren who say, just confess it, confess it, confess it. No, examine to see whether it's God's will, and if it is God's will, then confess it. Because we are not infallible. I mean, the, the, what, what took place in this last election cycle and all the prophets who prophesied this, that, and the other thing, well, guess what? Not all the prophets, what they said was hearing from God was from God. Most of them. So, Jesus shows us that what it means to pray in his name means to pray the same way he prayed. Not my will, but yours be done, Father. And right to the end, the devil is there trying to prosecute, trying to convict. One of the greatest temptations before the cross is Satan enters one of Jesus' 12, Judas. He enters into him thinking, this is going to really discourage him. I remember when I did this with Job and he lost his children. I'm going to let Jesus lose his children here. Jesus was so many steps ahead of the devil that he looked at all his disciples and said, you're all going to betray me tonight. Jesus says, okay, devil, you're going to try to steal one of my children? How about this? Go for it with all 12 of them. I'm ahead of you, devil. I, I, because I understand if you don't succeed with that one, you're going to go after the rest. And Jesus says, but I'll counter that with this. Peter, Satan has desired to have you to sift you as wheat. He said, Peter, Satan has desired to have you, plural, to sift you as wheat. He said, Peter, as the representative leader of the 12, Satan's coming after you, but he's coming after all, all of them. He says, so here's the deal, Satan. Do your job and prosecute, all right? But I'm going to pray to the Father that their faith will not fail them. Peter, when you're converted, when you're turned, when you are turned away from being driven by your own desires, then strengthen the brethren. So G Jesus knows what's going on. He understands what's going on. And then he goes, Jesus is thrust into the Sanhedrin, and they're the, the, the court of law, the Supreme Court, the ultimate political authority in Israel, and they're confronting him with false witnesses and liars, and they're putting pressure on him, and they're, they're saying basically the same thing that Pilate says a little bit afterward, and that is, you know, we have the power to sentence you. You better tell us the truth. And Jesus won't say a word to them. May I say unto you that the way you break human attacks is not to scream and fight back. When people are screaming and fighting back at you, don't scream and fight back. When you scream and fight back, they've won because they've upset you. They're controlling you. Their narrative is controlling you. Jesus showed us how to deal with it. He remained silent. My wife and I are currently in our, our own personal experience going through some of the most severe attacks, personal attacks that we've ever gone through. And what I say to my wife is, don't respond. Keep quiet. You, you do two things. You gain the victory and you disempower the mouth-speaking great thing. And Jesus says, 
he quotes Daniel 7. Remember when he's in the midst of the Sanhedrin? Daniel 7 is when the Son of Man is in the courtroom of heaven. And see, that, that's the key to it. Jesus says, here's how I will defeat you, Satan. You're trying to bring me into your court, but I'm in the court of heaven. And I know that you don't have the final say. My Father has the final say. And here's what I know. If you execute me and kill me, my Father's still going to vindicate me. If I live, I win. If I die, I win. Because my Father. And see, what that does, this is how you defeat the devil too. The devil will bring you. You have all kinds of desires, all kinds of fears, all kinds of situations that you want resolved in a certain way. Oh, Lord, if only you would answer this prayer my way, everything will be all right. No. If only you answer this prayer, everything will be all right. You don't have to answer it my way. Now, we pray, not my will but yours be done, but we can pray for things. We're not saying we can't pray for things and ask things of God. But if God doesn't give us what we've asked for, does that mean he hasn't answered our prayer? Not at all. The key is, is when you recognize that the answer to prayer is that the Lord transports you into his presence and says, you're my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. My soul is well pleased with you. Speak the word of the Lord. Speak the word of the Lord. Then when Jesus is taken before Pilate. Now Pilate, the, the Sanhedrin implied what Pilate came out and said. Pilate's a little bolder than the Sanhedrin because he works for the emperor who runs the world, okay? He, he works for, for, for the guy that has a, a, a larger empire than anyone has ever had in human history. And Pilate says, he's looking at Jesus and says, don't you know that I have the power of life and death over you. John 18, don't you know that? And Jesus says, no, I really don't know that. My Father in heaven has authority over you. Rome is only Rome because my Father has allowed it because it pleases him to accomplish his purposes. So, Jesus gains the victory. He shows Satan on behalf of his father. He said, human beings. Through a human being, there would be the exercise of God's kingdom authority in human history, and I've just done it, Satan. He's in charge, and he's given me kingdom authority. So, he dies, he's raised from the dead. Acts chapter 1, he spends 40 days, 40 nights with his disciples. He goes up to heaven, and that's the background to this. Acts 1.1, 1, 1, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to what? The kingdom of God. Pertaining to Genesis 1.28, the dominion mandate. Exercise the authority of my kingdom. He, he didn't spend 40 days and 40 nights teaching about how they were going to get saved and go to heaven and live life happily ever after and whatever they ask for, they'll get it and they'll just, you know, um, you know they can be hippies with Jesus in, in some, some commune off in the mountains. He didn't say that. He taught them about the kingdom. Basically, he's telling them, Okay, God's purposes are half fulfilled. As a human being, I have demonstrated to you it is possible to obey the Lord and deny yourself. It is possible to obey the Lord and not listen to Satan. It is possible to obey the Lord and overcome sin. It is possible. Now go out and do it, and when that's fulfilled, I will return 
a second time. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart. Notice how, 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 how Luke uses the words commandments and commanded. He gave them their orders. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now see, the first phase of the second coming of Jesus began 10 days after he ascended to heaven. See, Jesus, when we talk about the second coming, do you understand how many times Jesus has come? The first phase of the second coming is he came to them again in the Spirit. That's what he said in the Gospel of John. I'm leaving, he's coming. He used eschatological language. The, the Holy Spirit will come unto you. That's the second coming. That's the first phase of the second coming. Then he comes the second phase of the second coming is when he comes and he destroys Jerusalem in 70 AD, which prophesied in Matthew 24, in Mark 13, and in Luke 21. Yep, I'm coming. And I mean, they're, they're, of course, you got, you got full preterists who get so caught up in the, the fact that Jesus said he was coming again in 70 AD that they make that the second coming itself. It's not. It's a phase of the second coming. And it's showing a pattern that, yes, Jesus is coming a second time. The creeds say he's going to return a second time. But between his ascension to heaven and his second coming, he comes and he comes and he comes and he comes and he comes again. He comes to his church to assist them to carry out the kingdom mandate, the dominion mandate. And it doesn't matter what century you're in. It doesn't matter what nation you're in. It doesn't matter what your experience is. When God's people are threatened by the wrath of the dragon, because since Jesus ascended and he's cast down to earth, he's out to get us. Read Revelation 12. He is out to get us. And whenever it looks like Maybe he's getting close. Jesus comes. He comes in the midst of his church. He unveils himself and raises up apostles. He sends the outpouring of the Spirit. He raises up anointed ministries. He comes and he comes and he comes again. John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is the initial manifestation of the second coming of Jesus. Therefore, when they had come together, and this, this shows you, can you imagine, oh, and we all, I, I've said this, I shouldn't say we always say it, but I've heard so many people say it, I can almost say we've all, we always say it. Man, if I just would have lived in the days of Jesus, if I could have just walked Galilee, man, I, I would just believe and I wouldn't fail and I'd be perfect. Or if I could, if Jesus would just appear to me, like he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, like he appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead, uh, if, if as he appeared to John on the island of Patmos a few years before the destruction of Jerusalem, oh, if I, if I just, well, guys, here's a group of people they have just spent 40 days and night with the risen Lord. And, I mean, can you imagine after all that teaching? Let's ask a good question here. Peter's question is, all he wants to know is, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, you know, in fairness to Peter, we've, we've read the story. He's not coming, ever not coming ever to restore the kingdom to Israel. The kingdom is going to be restored to every tribe and every tongue and every people. Israel's going to be part of it. But notice, Peter's question reveals his heart. It's sort of like, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm glad you 
are, are you coming? Are you going to come for my family? When are you going to come for my family? The Lord's kind of like, uh, I'm coming for all the families of the earth. Well, what do you think? Uh, see, he's driven by his own needs, even after all of that. And this is, this is where I remind Christians not to be triumphalists. You can be a triumphalist. And this is what a triumphalist is. We are saints and not sinners. That's a triumphalist. Our identity is in Christ. We will never fail. We hear from God because we're the anointed. And of course, they, they tend to add under their breath, not like the rest of those idiot Christians who don't follow our traditions. See, what we don't understand about that is there's a right way to understand that we are victorious in Christ. We're overcomers in Christ. We're sons of God in Christ. That's our identity. But there's a wrong way to understand it, and we set ourselves up for going to a dark place where nothing we do is wrong. And when nothing we do is wrong, we align ourselves with all kinds of nonsense, political nonsense, religious nonsense, economic nonsense that has nothing to do with God's will. And the Holy Spirit can say, well, I'm just going to discredit all you believe. And my brothers and sisters, they're standing still. Oh, no, those prophecies weren't really wrong. They're just going to be fulfilled another way. Why? Because we're always right. See, that is wrong. We have to have a chastened view of everything. I am a saint. But I'm telling you, and I'm just telling you firsthand at 70, and I've said this and I'll say it every week till hopefully we all hear it. The Lord is shredding my life right now. It's, it's, it's almost like so many, God did so many good and wonderful and powerful things through Lord of the Harvest for so many years. And I just started thinking, whoa, man, am I something. You know, and then 2016 came, and then 2020 came, and then, and, and the Lord not only shredded me, he shredded this church. Because the Lord says, son, I said unto you, this is my church. I first person Jesus, will build my first person Jesus church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And what's the it? My building, my church. It's not your church, son. It's not your brilliance, son. It's not your greatness, son. It's not your anointing, son. So at 70, I've had, I mean, people think I was, you know, too reformed before all of this happened. Luther said we're simultaneously righteous and sinners. And people don't like that. And I, I was just that a little bit. Well, I'm way more that now because that's the only way I can be because I know I'm a saint. I know in Christ I have his righteousness his power, his anointing, his sanctification. I know that. I know he's the vine, I'm the branches. Apart from him, I can do nothing. But I know the other side of that, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But I also know, wow, I can step out of that reality any time I want. I remember my spiritual dad, Jim Murphy. We already mentioned Carolyn Murphy our spiritual mom here, my spiritual dad, Jim Murphy. Jim Murphy, can you imagine, 1971. We were one year old in the Lord, and God sent him to teach us. Wow. That teaching still remains with me. But in that, that, that uh, East Texas drawl, East, Tex East Texas Baptist drawl, he says, yeah, you know, they've asked me, can a Christian have a demon? He goes, a Christian can have anything he wants. He being dead yet speaks. 
Christian can't have anything he wants. And I'm just telling you, Peter is my hero because Peter is a powerful apostle and a knucklehead at the same time. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to reword Luther so I don't offend my Wesleyan brothers and sisters, my Armenian brothers and sisters. We are simultaneously apostles, anointed apostles, and idiots, and schmucks, and knuckleheads. And all I'm telling you is the one who's proving that to me, it's not, I'm not, it's not some book that I've read, uh, somebody's theology. Like, it's the theology of the Holy Spirit speaking to me face to face. Not in dreams and visions, but face to face. Jesus answered Peter in verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has placed under his own authority. In other words, you're never going to, you can't, you can't get ahead of God. You can't even get equal with God. The Lord's got this thing all worked out. I mean, if he just said, oh, by the way, you know, it's 30 AD and there's going to be somebody who's an heir to your gospel that you guys have preached or will preach so faithfully after I leave, there's going to be somebody in 2023 still saying, the Lord tarries. And the, there's only one reason why the Lord tarries. We still have a job to do. It's not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father has placed under his own authority. You, you, you're, you're never going to get all the details straight. Listen, I have read 40, 50, 70, 90 books on the book of Revelation. And every time I read a book, I come up with something I've never seen before, and it, i got to kind of shift my theology on the book of Revelation. Why? Because the God I serve is like a genius. He's way, way, he's so far beyond any of us. And that's why when, when people presume that their tradition and their theology is everything there is about the gospel, wow, I look at that and say, man, that's the that's the height of hubris. That's the height of arrogance to assume that. Come on, be a little bit humble. And so the term that, that, that I've seen frequently over these past 20 years is we need to have a chastened view of our theology. We need to have a humble view. And by a chastened view means a disciplined view. And how do you get a disciplined view? By being disciplined. You're going to be disciplined by the Lord. And Hebrews says, and that's a good thing, because somebody who's not disciplined is an illegitimate child. The old King James said a bastard and not a son. Because a real father disciplines his sons whom he loves. That today should be, the love of God, part five, but it's not, but we'll get love in there. So Jesus says this. So this is, he says, no, Peter, don't worry about all the details. Here's what I want you to worry about. But you will receive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, my martyrs in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. And at this point, all martyr is, it's one who's empowered to bear witness to what Jesus has done to fulfill God's kingdom mandate from Genesis 1, 28. And now we're going to bear witness to that and we're going to complete that. That's all it means at that point. By the time you get to the book of Revelation, where the word, all four of those words for for martyr and witness and testimony and bearing witness. All four of those words are all replete in that book. It's the final book of the New Testament. It's written to carry the church through church, the church age. And to carry the church through the church age, it's basically telling us what happened 
to the brothers and sisters from 60 to 70 A.D. is going to be the lot of the church for the rest of history. You will bear witness to me, and you'll be put to death for it. But my kingdom will prevail because when I was put to death, it wasn't the end. It was the, what word did we use today? The increase of God. Jesus' death brought the increase of the kingdom. When the disciples were martyred in the first century, it brought increase. The church did, wasn't stopped by martyrdom. So here we are on Martyr Sunday, the day of the Christian martyr, celebrating the feast of the martyrdom of Paul and Peter. I have a copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs combined with the modern version, Voices of the Martyrs, put out by the Voice of the Martyrs, that particular group. And Fox's Book of Martyrs is famous. It, it's, it lists all the martyrs in church history, the notable martyrs from 33 AD to the time of Fox. Fox died in the 1560s. So what, what the voice of the martyrs, that group, did was they added from the 1560s to the 21st century notable martyrs. Now here is the, here is the foreword. The foreword to this new copy is written by Gracia Burnham, who is part of a group called New Tribes Mission, and she's the author of the book, In the Presence of My Enemies. I'm going to read this. Gracia says, what did you expect following Christ would be like when you first started following him? I had read verses on suffering over and over while growing up, but somehow thought they didn't apply to me. Okay, I can tell you particularly in the West, in America, in Europe, some places in Europe, most of Europe, that word doesn't apply to them necessarily either. But if you go to the saints in Africa today, the saints in Asia, the saints in Latin America, it holds great meaning. Oh, P.S. It does hold great meaning to Americans and Westerners of African descent, they understand it, of Hispanic descent, they understand it, of Asian descent, they understand it, of indigenous First Nation people, they understand it, in America, because all of those peoples and nations have suffered martyrdom on the sake on behalf of the gospel. But Gracia says, nonetheless, but somehow I thought they didn't apply to me. My husband, Martin, and I did feel called to go overseas as missionaries, but I didn't really hear God calling us to suffer for his sake. If I had, maybe I wouldn't have answered the call. <laughs> oh, blessed ignorance. Actually, <laughs> if I understood then... What I know now, I don't think I would have responded to the call back in February 1970. I was perfectly content to live in a small barrio in the Philippines with my jungle pilot husband and our three children. We loved our ministry and our life overseas. We loved each other and our Lord Jesus. Then came May 27, 2001. Martin had to go to the southern island in Palawan to fill in for another New Tribes mission pilot, and I decided to go with him as he would have a heavy flying schedule and would need help. It would also be a chance to celebrate our wedding anniversary. We left our children with co-workers and told them we would return in one week, but life doesn't always go as planned, and we were taken hostage by militant Muslims while on Palawan. For the next year, we lived with the Abu Sayyaf 
in the jungles of Basilan, running from the military, sleeping on the jungle floor, starving, drinking dirty river water, watching the atrocities that these men inflicted on others, all the while wondering if we would ever see our home and family again. In one swift moment in time, everything I had, except Martin, was taken away from me. When everything is gone and you're in an uncomfortable position, you see what is really in your heart, and what I saw in mine was not pretty. I had always prided myself that I was a good Christian. She puts it in quotation marks. After all, we left the American dream to go overseas as missionaries, hadn't we? But in the jungle, I came face to face with a gracia that, didn't want, that I didn't want to see. I saw a hateful gracia. There were times I really hated those Muslims for what they were doing to us and for the pain they were causing our family. I saw a covetous gracia. While we were starving and I saw someone with food and they didn't share it with us, I coveted what they had. I saw a despairing gracia, a faithless gracia. See, she's being shredded by the Holy Spirit. When I saw the darkness of my heart, I began to cry out to God to change me. And in his faithfulness, he did just that. As the months rolled on, we began seeing our captors as the needy men that they were. You've heard it said that you will love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Pray for those who abuse you. Do good to those who persecute you. My hatred was replaced with concern and even love for them. Contentment and joy began to grow in my heart as I began acknowledging God's goodness to me on a daily basis instead of looking at the trials. God never leaves us as he finds us, and I am so grateful for his work in my life during that year. After 30, 376 days as hostages in gun battle number 17, my husband Martin was killed. I was wounded but rescued that day. When I got home to America, I learned that God had been touching the hearts of countless believers to pray for us. What would we have done without the prayers of God's people? Isn't the light isn't the life of a Christian not so much God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but rather this? See, that, that one's not in the Bible. You know that there is no verse that says God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Y you all know that, don't you? You all know that that's nowhere. It's not in Genesis. It's not in Malachi. It's not in Acts. It's not in Second Thessalonians. It's not in Revelation. It's not everywhere. It's not any of those places. It's not everywhere in the Bible at all. Isn't the life of a Christian not so much God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but here, and th this is in the Bible, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The testimonies of the martyrs in this book will challenge your faith. I don't know what the cross you are called to carry will look like. I do know that it won't be easy. As you read these stories, remember that these are not super Christians. They were ordinary men and women who faced situations beyond themselves and have died to themselves and found Christ to be sufficient. And then she quotes 1 Peter 2, 21 and 23. For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. In the Sanhedrin, no, I'm not in your courtroom. I'm in my father's courtroom. To Pilate, nah. You don't have power over life and death with me. My Father does. God calls us to carry our crosses. Jesus shows us how to do that. Follow in his steps as these Christian martyrs have done. Gracia Burnham. Now, let's see where we are here. Where are we? I, I, I 
y you know, it's pretty obvious I lose track of time. All right. We were having a discussion. I'm going to say this is, eh, I'm going to say it sometime in 2020, group of pastors. And, you know, this is at a time when there's a lot of pressure going on. There's COVID, there's the racial hostilities and controversies going on in the nation. There's the, these uh, rabidly contested elections going on. There's division in the church. And pastors are talking about we've got to fight against the left and fight against communism and we need to fight against false prophecy and the lies and we need to make America great again and we need to you know we need to get rid of all these ungodly laws so that our country can return to its heritage and there you know people are going on and on and I mean it's a rabid discussion rabid as in a rabid dog okay I could see I could hear people foaming at the mouth it was a, it was like a like a, a zoom call so they got to me and it was my turn and so you know what what are you uh, what are you doing Oz in your congregation I go I'm I'm preparing uh, the members of my church to be martyrs there was silence it was a deafening silence of disapproval and I know the disapproval because Shortly after that, some people who are on that call published these emails and these blog things, and 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 you know it was talking about well, not things that weren't very very flattering to say my position. It, I wasn't named or anything in it, but boy, I I I I sure heard the words, and God calls us to rise up, to hear the voices of the martyrs from all of church history and to recognize that he that seeks to save his life will lose it. He that loses his life for my sake, the same will save it. That's what martyrdom is, okay? I've told every, I've told this to my people many times you don't have to die literally die to be a martyr but you need to be a martyr you need to bear witness to Jesus and you bear witness to Jesus exactly the way it's been laid out at the start here you recognize that you have an agenda in your heart okay you're a saint with an agenda Wait, I got a better saying. You're a saint with a satanic agenda. Saint, satan it works. You're a saint with a satanic agenda in your heart. And the satanic agenda, because stop and look at it. Satan was just doing his job, right? But it got to the point where he was so interested in winning. He was so interested in successfully prosecuting that he would go to any ends to get that prosecution, including false witnesses. Jesus, they were false witnesses. They, they, they came out of the they they came out of the cupboards. I mean they, they came out like cockroaches hidden in the house, just creepy, bizarre creatures that you can run over with a bike and they keep going. They came out to slander him. And see, that's where Satan went wrong. Where his desires became the ultimate source, the ultimate goal, the ultimate focus of his own allegiance. So yes, we are saints and sinners, and I'll tell you why. Because the Holy Spirit has come upon us. God has given us his righteousness. God has given us his power to do his will, but there's this area in our heart called what I want from life. What I want from life. It's hidden in there, it's buried in there, 
and it wars with us. It wars with us. It's a constant battle. And sometimes you might have some great years from 50 to 60, 50 to 65, and all of a sudden at 65 the Lord says, hmm, it's, it's, it's the feast of the unleavened bread, and I have to take the candle and go through the house and find every little tiny bit of leaven. That's what the Jews do for the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. They take a candle. Well, now they take a flashlight, but they took candles back then. They take a flashlight, and they look for any leaven, little tiny scraps of leaven, and they remove them from their house. And that's what the Lord does. It says the spirit of man, this is Proverbs, is the candle of the Lord. It's a reference to Passover. Searching out the leaven. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts, the hidden parts of the belly. And the Lord goes through, and it's like at 65, wow, things, things, things are pretty good here for us here at Lord of the Harvest. We're doing fine. We're doing wonderful. I'm the great, mighty, powerful man of God. And, and I let everybody know it, and I speak condescendingly to them while I do it. And then the Lord says, Passover time, son. I'm putting you in a I'm putting you in a seven year Passover cycle. Here comes my candle. The spirit is the, the place in our inner being where the revelation from the Lord comes. And usually the spirit reveals faith. The spirit reveals hope. The spirit reveals love. The spirit releases gifts. The spirit releases anointing. But this time the spirit decided to say. Oh, there, there's a leaven there, son. Hey, there's another piece. And there's another. Hey, there's a pile over here. There's a stack of leaven here, son. But wait a second, Lord. From 50 to 65, I was God's man of faith and power. Yeah, you were. You're, you're a saint. Well, what am I now? Well, you're a sinner, too, because there's leaven in there, son. There's no leaven in me. There's no leaven in my son. See, from 50 to 65, you were stepping in Christ. You were living out of that dimension, that zone, that reality of in Christ. The Lord said, but you know, you were stepping outside of that zone. Every so often, you didn't even realize it. You kind of dart out and get a little angry and dart out and mistreat somebody over here and dart out over here and be a a smart donkey's rear. You, you, you were doing these things, and you've been doing them all along. You just dart, you're smart enough to dart back into Christ where his righteousness is your righteousness. And see, son, when you were out there, when you were out there, well, the enemy would get a hold of you and use you not as a witness for me, but just, just, just as a knucklehead. So get it right, son. Get it right. All right. A couple minutes. I said, I mean, there's, there are verses about the witness so, so many places. Just let's go to Revelation because it's easier just to stick in one book. And let's close up. Let's honor St. Peter and Paul, let's honor the martyrs in Fox's Book of Martyrs. And you know, where did Fox started in what he called 33 AD. Who's the first martyr in 33 AD? Stephen. He starts with Stephen. He's not technically correct. The first martyr was three and a half years before that. Jesus is the first martyr of the church. So Jesus, our example, was martyred. If he said in Revelation 14, that the 144,000 follow the Lamb wherever he goes. That's the ideal, you know, the ideal human being, okay? You understand people divide, they, they, you know, you look for significance with biblical numbers, okay? Most people see 144 as, uh, you know, it's 144 is is. 12 times 12. 
And so they see there's 144. It's 12 is the number of God's government, you know, 12 tribes, 12 apostles. But if you read the context, the 144,000 appear right after, 14.1, right after the end of chapter 13 in Revelation. Chapter 13 and 11 says 6 is the number of man. Okay, 6 is the number of man. 666 is the number of the beast. But it's because he's the ultimate anti-God, anti-Christ man. 666. If you divide 6 in 144, because John, John doesn't have chapters and verses. He goes right from 6 is the number of man to 144,000 are those that follow the Lamb wherever he goes. 144 is 24 times 6. The 24 elders represent the priesthood. There are 24 units, 24 units of the priesthood, and they rotated service in the temple. One through 24, and then they started over. There were just 24 different rotations of the priesthood that performed the service. 24 times 6 priesthood. Ideal of humanity, 6. Six, the number of man, man was created on the sixth day, is to be a priest under the Most High God. 24 times 6. Jesus is the ultimate priest, the high priest of God. And as the priest, he is the first martyr. He doesn't shed the blood of bulls and goats. It's his own blood that's shed. For us to be a kingdom of priests, we need to be martyrs. Now, I don't know whether everybody in here is going to be martyred literally for Jesus. But see, when you live your life for Jesus, when you say no to forming an ultimate allegiance to the desires in your heart and say yes to his desires, when you Say, not my will, but yours be done. See, you're, you're, you're living as a martyr. See, see, martyrdom isn't something you just, like, one day you get thrust into it and, oh, I'm ready to be a martyr. It's a process. You are living your life every day being a martyr, bearing witness to Jesus by proclaiming his word to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, to recognizing that the infilling of the Spirit is to make you a witness to Him, to live out the way He lives. But you're also doing what Jesus did every day. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You're putting God's word first. Second, you're saying, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You know what it means to put the Lord your God to the test? Well, Lord of the Harvest knows it. What did I preach? I preached six months or eight months, one year, on the temptations of Jesus to, to describe what the word. But the devil quotes Psalm 91 to Jesus. He says, go up to the pinnacle of the temple, throw yourself down. Psalm 91 says that his angels will bear you up lest you dash your feet against the stone. You'll not be harmed. You'll not be hurt. Just follow God's word. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do that. You won't put the Lord your God to the test. You don't take God's word and tell him what to do. Well, Jesus, I want to, this, this looks like a good plan to me. I'm going to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. I, I'll, I'll get a book contract. I'll, I'll, I'll be able to, to be on the satellite network. I'll, I'll command, uh, thousands will come to see the guy who jumped off the pinnacle of the temple and the angels came and picked him up. I mean, I'll be such a witness and a testimony to the Lord. That's putting, even using the word to reinforce the desires of your heart. You don't tell God what to do on the basis of his word. He tells you what to do. And what Jesus was saying is, I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. If he tells me to jump off the pinnacle of the temple, I'll do it. And it, you know what telling you to jump off the pinnacle of the temple is? Put your life in my hands, son. You're going to die. And the pinnacle of the temple that you're going to die on is a cross. 
the Lord will tell you when that moment comes. And then the third temptation is, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. In other words, what the, what the devil does to trip people up is he gives you this perfect strategy to carry out God's will in your life. And this perfect strategy, what it really means in its essence is you're bowing down to someone or something else. You're bowing down to a strategy to accomplish God's purpose. There's only one strategy to accomplish God's purposes. Be obedient. When you live your life like that, you are overcoming the devil. When you live your life like that, you're saying no to self and yes to God. When you live your life like that, you are picking up the cross and following him. You're being a martyr. And so what Mike Osminski at least has humbly attempted to do for his entire walk with Jesus is every day to put to death the flesh and to allow the Spirit of God to make me alive in him. I'm learning what it means to be a martyr. It's Polycarp, the great first century patristic father, the early church fathers, the old man. I told you the story. He's a martyr. He should be in, uh, he should be in uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. There it is, page 57, Polycarp of Smyrna. Let's see, when did he die? Uh, 155 A.D. All he had to do was say, Caesar is Lord. The soldiers, the Roman soldiers, they knew Polycarp was a bishop. Okay, he's an old man in this. You know, he's, he's 85 years old. He has faithfully served the Lord for 85 years. The, the, the Roman soldiers love him. The Roman officials love him because he shows kindness to the poor. He cares for the oppressed. He shows the love of God in Jesus. And they're like, Polycarp, we know you don't. You, we know Jesus is Lord to you, not Caesar. We know that. You know that. Just say it. It doesn't mean anything. Just say it, you know? It's, it's not a big deal. We all know who your Lord is. Because Polycarp, we're soldiers, and we've been ordered to execute you. Don't, we don't want to execute you. Just say it. No one will take it seriously. You know, some some bureaucrat in Rome or something like, or bureaucrat in, in Ephesus will say, oh yeah, he said it, okay, he's cleared next. And Polycarp just looks at him and says, my Lord has never denied me once in my life. I shall not deny him. And he goes to his death. You know why? Because at 85 years of age, Every day of his life, he had learned what it meant to be a martyr. You, you know, it's going to take a miracle of God if you're living for yourself. And then real martyrdom you're faced with. It's, it's not like you just have a, a switch in there to flip. You need to be faithfully practicing martyrdom every day of your life. And that's just, it's denying yourself. I, I close in the book of Revelation. What time is it? Always 12.29. I got one minute to finish this, right? All right. Revelation chapter 1, verse 2. John sees Jesus unveiled in Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, and it says, we'll start in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus, the unveiling of Jesus, which God gave Jesus, gave him to show his bondservants, his disciples, Jesus' disciples, the things which must occur shortly. And he made it known by sending it through his angel to his bondservant, John, who bore witness, testified. There's the, there's the, the Greek word for bearing witness. 
who bore witness to the word of God and bore witness to the testimony of Jesus Christ as many things as he saw. So, so the whole purpose of the book of Revelation is to show us what the testimony of Jesus is and how that works itself out in the church and how the church carries it out. Blessed is the one who reads. Oh, Alexa wants to comment on, on the book of Revelation. Blessed is he who reads, those who hear the words of this prophecy and who keep the things that are written in it, for the time is near. We read the book of Revelation aloud, aloud as we're doing now. We hear the words of the book, which is a prophecy, and we keep the things that are written in it, for the time is near. We're being prepared for martyrdom. John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from God. Now, there's a Trinitarian greeting here. The Father is seen in these terms. Grace to you and peace from God the Father. He who is, he who was, and he who is to come. The one who has moved in the past, the one who's moving in the present, the one who's moving in the future. That's the Father is seen as the one who is self-existent, works forever with God's people, and is going to work with them to the end. Second, from the seven spirits, which are before the throne of the Father. The spirit in the book of Revelation brings us into the presence of God's throne, the place of his authority, the place of his power. And watch how Jesus is characterized. And from Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. He is the faithful witness in his life and death. He's the firstborn of the dead in his resurrection, and he's the ruler of the kings of the earth in his ascension. And this is what he's accomplished. To him who loves us, here's the love of God, who loves us and washes us from our sins in his blood, and he made us a kingdom of priests to our God and his Father, to him be glory and power and dominion. So Jesus is the faithful witness. And as the faithful witness who has this kingdom authority, who was raised from the dead, who washes us from our sins in his blood, he, who makes us a kingdom of priests, who loves us, he makes us into his witnesses as well. And then the verse we've, I've quoted, what, every time for probably the last 10 weeks on the Wednesday night study, verse 9. I, John, your brother, your partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the perseverance in Christ Jesus, I found myself in prison by the Roman Empire. I found myself on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This is where it always leads us. Our bearing witness to Christ will lead us the same place that it led Jesus. It will always lead us to Patmos. We're exiled. We're exiled from all those around us. We, we live and dwell in a dimension that no one who is outside of Christ understands. And the only way they can understand is we welcome them in and they join with us. But we will always end up on our own Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The tradition is, is that after Paul and Peter, which we celebrate on June 29th, after they were martyred and after all the rest of the original disciples and James, the Lord's brother, all those initial apostles were martyred, John was the only one left alive. And church tradition says they tried to martyr him and they couldn't. He was miraculous. It's like, you know, Daniel in the lion's den. I think the story was they had a boiling cauldron and they threw John into it and they couldn't kill him because there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a, another figure like unto a son of God 
in the cauldron with them, so they just took them out and said, I just just throw them in a hit the prison cauldron. We're going to close then. The Lord has called us and encouraged us. And I hope today has just given us some real practical strategies. People always say, well, Oz, I like theology, and, but it's so abstract. Just, this is, this is one of my pastor friends, and he'll always meet with me. He says, okay, thanks for all that theology. Now, give me some practical steps here. What's the value of that theology? Well, here's the value of the theology. We said it today. Pick up the cross and follow Jesus. And in a simple way, it means you have to say about those desires in those hidden cabinets of your heart, yes, I'm going to pray for it. You could, Unless the Holy Spirit shows you to stop praying for something, pray for it. Well, I've got this prophetic word. It still hasn't come to pass. Well, it could be like those people prophesying on saying, oh, it's gonna, we're going to find a way for it to come to pass. Well, it already hasn't come to pass. It could be that, but it could be a legitimate thing. You, you pray, but you add, not my will, but yours be done. See, to me, if you're praying for something, claiming something, declaring something, crying out to God for something, and you can't say at the end of that prayer, however, not my will, but yours be done. You're not quite yet at the place where you need to be in Jesus. Now, when I was younger, I wouldn't have taken my own advice. I'm praying for this, and I'm praying for this, and I'm praying for this, and nobody's going to change my mind. Why? Because I want it. I want it more than anything. You get older, and you find out those prayers that the Lord said no to, because they weren't his will, he gave you something better. You didn't get what you wanted, you got something better. Now you got to suffer through that not getting what you want, but see that's what makes us chastened saints, humble saints, broken saints. You, you understand that's what meekness is. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. People say, What's, what does meekness mean? And I know most of the, trans, the modern translations have opted for gentleness. You know how you get gentle? By hearing the word no. You know how you get gentle? By being broken. You know how you get gentle? By the Father saying, Son, I'd love to give you that, but if I actually answered your prayer, it, it, would, it would destroy you. And you don't know that now, and you don't understand that now, but no, son. Meekness is, is when you, you're broken and, and you come through the answers to prayer that are no, that you become chastened. And you begin to look at your brothers and sisters in a different way. The brothers and sisters that I'd say, I mean, I was a pastor rebuker. You know, I just rebuked everybody. Uh, my, uh, the pastors, people don't understand this. The guys I hung out with, I'm talking about my peers. I used to rebuke them all the time. You guys, I treat all you guys kind. You're like my children. I treat my children better than I treat my brothers and sisters. My brothers and sisters, look at me, you're an idiot. And I know it because I've been with you for years, and you, you've always been an idiot. And I rebuked, and I was angry, and I was, was, was vicious. Everybody thinks, well, he didn't say that about, you know, I don't like how so-and-so teaches or acts and he always defends them to me. Yeah, I defend them to you because you got no business talking about somebody who has more authority than you do in the Lord and who has living. I, I don't care if you've seen 10 things that you can accuse that leader of not doing rightly. They've done 30 things right that you don't even have a clue to. You don't have it. And so I will defend people. But when I'm with that person behind closed doors, look out. But I have been so broken these last seven years that I've, I've begun to take a different look at my brethren and say, well, yeah, you got this wrong and you got this wrong and you got this wrong and you haven't listened to me in any of those things. But you know what my father is showing me? I got this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. 
and I haven't listened to him. And so even though I recognize that I am seeing things apostolically that are very significant and needed in the body of Christ and are rejected by my own brothers and sisters because they're, they have greater allegiance to their agendas and desires than they do to the Lord, even though I see myself as being part of the problem because I'm there too. It's just different things that God's dealing with me. And my hope and my prayer is that what the Lord is about to do, because you remember, I mean, the disciples were idiots. They betrayed Jesus. All of them. All of them, guys. It's a false teaching to say that Judas betrayed Jesus. They all betrayed Jesus. Except the women, of course, who didn't betray Jesus, who held their ground and stood their ground. But the Lord, other than one, one out of 12, what's, what's one out of 12? 8.3%. So 8.3% of the brethren, maybe eight out of 100 that you're angry with and criticizing and they don't get this right, close to 92% of them are going to be redeemed by our God. And I'm all for that because I want to be part of that 92%. I don't want to be part of that 8%. Well, it only took me 12 minutes to do one minute. It's 12 minutes past or Oz time is one minute, right? I don't, I don't know. Be with us, Father. I, I thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone forth as martyrs, Lord. And I want to pray for the families of those and the friends and the brothers and sisters who have lost good, good people to martyrdom. I'm just going to read the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I praise you as our all-knowing God. You miss nothing. All things matter to you, especially the death of your saints and the lives of those they leave behind. Lord, I lift up the surviving spouses of martyrs. May they experience your presence through the companionship of the Holy Spirit. Father, I lift up the children of martyrs. May they hold no bitterness toward you or others for the loss of their parents. And may they grow into mature disciples and seek to advance your kingdom. Almighty God, I lift up the disciples of martyrs. May they continue to gather for worship and share your good news without fear. And may this be a powerful witness to the lost. May the lives of martyrs who paid the ultimate price for following you inspire us to live in fearless faith as your obedient witnesses. I pray that we will continue the job of Lord of the Harvest of making and preparing men and women to be martyrs. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, God bless you, brothers and sisters. Serve the Lord.